Take your Bibles and turn with me to Isaiah 36 and 37. I'm talking today about, O oh Lord, deliver us. Say that with me. O oh Lord, deliver us. We need more O's in our prayers. O oh Lord, deliver us. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you, Mary Beth. Well, on February the 24th, a little over a month ago, you know that Russia invaded Ukraine. How did all that come about? It's been brewing for years. Let's go back just 31 years to December the 1st, 1991. It wasn't long after the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine voted to become a sovereign state independent from Russia. Three years later, they signed the Budapest Memorandum. It was signed by the United States, Russia, the United Kingdom, and Ukraine. And in that, Ukraine gave up all of its nuclear bombs. They were a country that had a lot of nuclear bombs in there when they were under the Soviet Union. And the nations that signed that statement, that memorandum, honored Ukraine's sovereignty, including Russia, including Russia. Then 14 years ago today, Russia opposed Ukraine joining NATO. Putin allegedly said to President Bush, Ukraine is not a real nation or state. That was 14 years ago today. And then, a few years later, from November the 2013 to 2014, Ukraine's President Yanukovych began to turn Ukraine back toward Russia again. But the people of Ukraine protested. And Yanukovych fled to Russia, and the new leadership turned Ukraine toward the European Union. In the spring of 2014, Russia seized a portion of Ukraine called Crimea. How many of you remember that? I can remember it just as plain as day. And the UN and the European Union strongly condemned what the Russians refer to as a mere annex. April 21, 2019, Vladimir Zelensky was elected president of Ukraine. It's the first time that he and his party also had the majority of the seats in Ukraine's parliament. He promised to end the war with Russia and root out corruption in Ukraine's government. He cracked down on pro-Russian leaders in Ukraine, including one of Putin's best friends, Viktor Melvichuk. Now, they're laughing at the way I pronounce all that, but you don't know the difference anyway, all right? <laughs> I learned a long time ago when you're preaching, you come to a hard word, just say it the best you can and move on. Putin responded by sending Russian troops to the Ukrainian border. December 2021, Putin demanded that NATO and the U.S. never admit Ukraine to NATO. Of course, that request was rejected. And then, two months later, February the 24th, Russia launched its horrendous, diabolical, all-out invasion against Ukraine. Ukrainian President Zelensky, you ought to pray for that man, declared martial law in Ukraine, broke all diplomatic ties with Russia, and the war continues. That's where we find ourselves today. Now, we look at things like Russia threatening and invading Ukraine, and we cringe, rightfully so. But I would say to you that 
similar events have taken place throughout history. It doesn't water it down. It just means that this is nothing new. There have always been tyrants. There have always been bullies. There have always been people who have as their goal to take over other nations. Today we're going to look at one of those instances in Scripture and it's so important to the message of God of what happened with this that God put it in the Bible twice. He put it in the book of Isaiah and then he put it in the book of 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. It's when Sennacherib, the wicked king of Assyria, came and tried to fight against Judah and Jerusalem. And Judah's righteous king, Hezekiah, responded by crying out for the Lord's help. And when he cried out, when he prayed, when he fasted, when he tore his clothes because of the blasphemy of the messengers from Assyria, he cried out with these words, O oh Lord, deliver us. Prayers don't have to be long to be powerful. O oh Lord, deliver us. Say it with me. O oh Lord, deliver us. Three things about deliverance. The reason for deliverance. Why do God's people need deliverance? I'll tell you why. If you live for the Lord long enough, you will be attacked. You'll be attacked for living for the Lord. God's people have enemies who are inspired by our ultimate enemy and adversary, the devil himself. Now you're going to find out that King Hezekiah lived for the Lord. He led Judah to a spiritual revival. He loved the Lord God. He prayed fervently, as we will see. He despised pagan idolatry, as we will see. He loved all the men of God like the prophet Isaiah, as we will see. Yet, even though he was righteous, even though he was leading in a revival, righteous Hezekiah and Judah, who had turned to the Lord under his leadership in a time of revival, were attacked by the enemy. A righteous leader is always a target for the devil and his minions. Judah needed deliverance from wicked Assyria because Judah's leader, Hezekiah, genuinely loved the Lord. Some of you think that if I read the Bible and I pray and I tithe and I witness and I disciple people, the devil will leave me alone. I got news for you. Just the opposite is true. He's coming after you because you're trying to be the real thing. The devil sent his emissaries from Assyria. Look at verse 1 in chapter 36. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh. That's really not a name. It's the name of an office of a high-ranking person in the Assyrian army. From Lachish to Jerusalem, to King Hezekiah with a large army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway of the fuller's field. Then Eliakim, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household in Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to him. Now get the picture. The wall of Jerusalem is behind them. These three Judean men come out to face the army of the enemy of God. And they face the Rabshakeh, the leader who is representing King, Z Z what was his name? <laughs> I'll get in here a second. I've been forgetting this all night and I do not have memory loss if you're worried about that, all right? Sennacherib. Would you all say that with me? Sennacherib. Say that 50 times before you go to bed. All right. 
Then the Rabshakeh said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, verse 4, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What is this confidence that you have? I say, your counsel and strength for the war are only empty words. Now on whom do you rely that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you rely on the staff of this crushed reed, even on Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. Now let me show you what he's doing. He's saying, Egypt is like a crutch that you're leaning on, but it's just a reed, and when you lean on it, it's going to go through your hand like a spear. That's exactly what he's saying. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who rely on him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and has said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar. He was referring to the fact that righteous Hezekiah had rid the whole land of all Baal worship and rid the whole land of Ashtaroth worship. And he was calling them, to him all the gods were the same. He was saying, he's cleansed out all of your places of worship. How are you going to worship the Lord? That's the only way they could worship the Lord, is to get rid of all the false gods. Then he resorted to sarcasm. Look at verse 8. Now therefore, come, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. How then can you repulse one official of the least of my master's servants and rely on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen. Then he claimed that the Lord himself had sent him, which was a lie. Verse 10, have I come up without the Lord's approval against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. At that time, Judah's leaders politely asked the Assyrian leaders to speak in Aramaic rather than in Hebrew, so that the common people of Jerusalem who were listening from the wall wouldn't hear their message and be afraid. Look at verse 11. Then Eliakim and Shebnon Zoah, Joah said to Rabshakeh, speak now to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it, and don't speak with us in Judean in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But when the Aramean, when the Assyrians arrogantly refused to change their speech. They turned up the volume and spoke even louder. Look at verse 12. But Rabshakeh said, has my master sent me only to your master and to you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall doomed to eat their own dung and drink their own urine with you? What's that all about? They were going to starve them out until they would resort to eating and drinking like that. Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in Judean, that is in Hebrew, and said, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, don't let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. And nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Don't listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria. Oh, make your peace. Doesn't this just sound like the devil? Make your peace with me. Come out to me. Eat each of his vine, each of his fig tree. Drink each of the waters of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. All will be well if you just worship me, if you just surrender to me. You can live comfortably here until we take you away as slaves. Beware that Hezekiah does not mislead you, saying the Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath? Verse 19. And Arpad, where are the gods of Sepharvim? And when have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their land from my hand that the Lord would deliver Jerusalem from my hand? This is where he crossed a line. This is where he got in trouble, major league with God. But notice 
The response, may I say it, the resounding loud response of silence. And that's exactly what they deserved. But they were silent, verse 28, 21, and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn. Why? They had just heard someone blaspheme the Lord, and whenever that happened, they tore their clothes. Remember when Jesus was before the Sanhedrin and they hypocritically tore their clothes when he said, I am the Son of God? He wasn't blaspheming. He was telling the truth. But these people are blaspheming, so they tore their clothes, and rightfully so. The people of Judah needed deliverance from the attacks of their enemies, and the only reason they did is because they were living for the Lord. If you live for the Lord, you're going to be attacked. You say, I just can't believe that, Brother Steve. I, I just thought if I lived for Jesus, all my problems would be gone. Man, you hadn't seen problems till you start living for Jesus. You say, well, that blessed my heart, Brother Steve. I appreciate you saying that. How many of you want to hear the truth? All right. I just told it to you. You're going to have a tough time if you live for the Lord. But you're going to have the Lord to bring you through the tough times. Jesus said so. Remember the word, John 15, 20, that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. Remember Paul and Barnabas, were they persecuted? I guess so. Acts 14, 12, 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. All that's good. Now listen, and saying, through many what? Say it out loud. Tribulations. We must. Enter the kingdom of God. Paul said to Timothy, not long before Paul died, in 2 Timothy 3, 12, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All. The reason God his people need deliverance is because if you live for the Lord long enough, you're going to be attacked. And yet today, I invite you to live for Jesus. If you're not a Christian, you need to become a Christian today. How do you do that? You repent. You turn from your sins. You apologize for your sins. You tell the Lord you're sorry for your sins. You own up for your sins. You have broken the laws of God. The wages of sin is death. And you say to God, I am sorry for my sin. I repent, and I don't want to live like a sinner anymore. I can't promise you I'll never sin again, but I can tell you I don't want to. Oh, God, I repent of my sin. If you don't repent, you don't go to heaven. You don't know God. You're going to spend eternity separated from God in hell if you don't repent. You've got to repent. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I'm quoting Jesus. And then you have to believe. You have to believe not just in whatever you want to believe. I, I hear say, well, I believe. Well, what do you believe in? You've got to believe in a bloody cross and an empty tomb. You've got to believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and paid the penalty for your sin. That Jesus, while he was on the cross, was paying the sin debt that he did not owe because you owed a sin debt you could not pay and Jesus Christ died as an atoning sacrifice, a propitiation for your sins. He died in your place. He shed his blood for you and only the blood of Jesus can forgive your sins. You've got to believe that in order to be saved. And you've got to believe that even though they buried him, God raised him up bodily, not just his teachings came out, but the teacher himself came out, raised him up bodily, victoriously, and he turned it from the grave. You have to believe that Jesus died on a bloody cross and that he rose from an empty grave. You've got to believe that if you're going to become a Christian. You've got to. 
And then you've got to receive him. You've got to invite him to come into your life. As many as receive him, to them he gives the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Oh, Jesus, I repent of my sins. I'm sorry for my sins. I believe you died for me. I believe that you paid my price of my sin on the cross. I believe that you rose from the dead. I repent, I believe, and I receive you. Take all of me, Lord Jesus. I give all of myself to you. I give all of my past, all of my present, all of my future. I give myself to you. Oh, Jesus, save me today. Save me today, Lord Jesus. Have you ever done that? Well, I joined the church. I didn't ask you about that. Did you join Jesus? I invite you to Jesus. And if you're a Christian, I invite you to live for him every day. And when you do, the devil's going to come after you. You know, when you're walking along with a bunch of people and you're all going the same way, you don't bump into anybody much. But when you turn around and start walking against the flow, you're going to bump into a lot of folks and you're going to bump into the devil. Just the way it is. All who live for Christ will be attacked. That's the reason for deliverance. Number two, the reason, the requirement for deliverance now. I'm going to find out when I get to heaven why God made pollen, aren't you? <laughs> Tell me what's right. Excuse me. I'm struggling a little bit. God has a requirement for his people who are attacked. What's that requirement? When God's people are attacked, they must give their burden to the Lord in prayer. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Virtuous King Hezekiah wisely took his burden to the Lord in prayer. First, he called on the man of God, the one he knew that was the real man of God. Look at verse 1 in chapter 37. And when King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes. He did that again because of the blasphemy of the Assyrians. He covered himself with sackcloth. He entered the house of God. Matthew Henry said, Rabshakeh tried to frighten Hezekiah from the Lord, but he actually frightened him to the Lord. Who I like that. You want, to read, you want to read a hardcore guy? Man, go read Matthew Henry. He's, he's good. He's been dead a long time. He's been shouting a long time, amen? Look at verse two. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, with Shebna, the scribe of the elders and the priest, covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, they said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress. I got news for you. Every day of distress should be a day of prayer. It's a day of distress, rebuke, and rejection for children have come to birth and there's no strength to deliver. Perhaps the Lord your God will hear the words of Rabshakeh whom his master, the king of Assyria, Nebuchadnezzar, I remembered it. How about that? Somebody say amen to that, I remembered it, all right? Great. Has sent to reproach the living God and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, offer a prayer for the remnant that is left. What a great statement. When it's a day of distress, it's a day of prayer. Isaiah heard the Assyrians' threats and he didn't flinch and he didn't panic. He was a man of God. I would encourage you to spend so much time with God that you're not afraid of any man. Spend so much time with God alone that you're not afraid of any man. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. Isaiah said to them, thus you shall say to your master, thus says the Lord. Well, when God says that, you better watch out. Something good's about. And look at the next words. Don't be afraid. Let's all say it out loud. Don't be afraid. Why? Because of the words that you've heard with which the servants of the king of Syria have blasphemed me. God's talking. Behold, I will put a spirit in him so that he will hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will make him fall by the sword in his own land. And everything God said took place. What Isaiah prophesied is exactly what happened. Sennacherib started fighting another army, temporarily stopped focusing on Judah. Verse 8 says, Then Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he had heard that the king had left Lachish. 
So Rabshakeh again threatened King Hezekiah when he heard them say concerning Tirha, Tirhakah, whatever king of Cush, he has come out to fight against you. And when he heard it, he sent messengers to Hezekiah saying, thus you shall say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, don't you let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem will not be given in the hand of the king of Assyria. Oh, hold on now. You're telling Hezekiah not to trust in the Lord. Bad idea. And he tried to compare the one true almighty God with the fake, impotent, pagan gods. Look at verse 11. Behold, you've heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, destroying them completely, so will you be spared. Did the gods of those nations which my fathers have destroyed deliver them, even Gozan and Haran and Rezev and the sons of Eden who were in Telazar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Zephyrvim, and Henna and Iva. The Syrians had defeated pagan nations, but they were impotent because they didn't have God. But Judah was the nation of Almighty God. The king of Assyria had never faced anybody like Judah. He communicated his threats through a letter. And you know what Hezekiah did? Here's what he did with that letter. Look at verse 14. Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it and went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. That's the perfect thing to do with a letter like that. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Say that with me. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord saying, Oh, Lord. That's a good way to start your prayer with that little word, oh. He's awesome. If you could see him, you'd say, oh. Oh, Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. That's the way you start a prayer, with praise. Incline your ear, O oh Lord. Hear, open your eyes, O oh Lord. And see, listen to all the words of Sennacherib who sent them to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated all the countries and their lands, and they've cast their gods in the fire, for they were not gods, but the works of men's hands, wood and stone, so they've destroyed them. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us. That's where I got the title right there. From his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. The Lord heard Hezekiah's prayer and responded instantly. Verse 21, then Isaiah, who had, he had not heard the prayer. He just heard from God. Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent word to Hezekiah. He was far away, saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me. Because you have prayed to me. Prayer makes a difference. Because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria. Not just complained about it, but you've prayed about it. This is the word that the Lord has spoken against him. The Lord who was mocked is about to mock his mocker. Look at verse 22. She has despised you. He's talking about Israel and Judah. She has despised you and mocked you, the virgin daughter of Zion. She has shaken her head behind you, the daughter of Jerusalem. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? And against whom have you raised your voice and haughtily lifted your eyes against the Holy One of Israel through your, the, through your servants? You have reproached the Lord and you have said with my many chariots, I came up to the heights of the mountains, to the remotest parts of Lebanon, and I cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypresses, and I will go up to its highest peak, its thickest forest. I dug wells and drank waters, and with the sole of my feet, I dried up all the rivers of Egypt. God then told the Assyrians that he was the reason that they had done so well against those other nations, not them, but him. God said, have you not heard? Long ago, God said, I did it. From ancient times, I planned it. Now, I have brought it to pass that you should turn for those fortified cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore, their inhabitants were short of strength. They were dismayed. They were put to shame. They were as the vegetation of the field, as the green herb, as grass on the housetops is scorched before it grows up. The Lord then told the Assyrians he knew all about their sinful actions and their boasting, and he was about to punish them. Look at verse 28. But I know you're sitting down, and you're going out, and you're coming in, and you're raging against me because of your raging against me. And because of your arrogance has come up to my ears, therefore I will 
will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your hips, and I will turn you back the way which you came. Then God gave Hezekiah and God's people a promise that filled them with hope for their immediate future. Look at verse 30. Then this shall be the sign for you. Now he's talking to Hezekiah and that bunch. He says, you will eat this year what grows of itself. In the second year, what springs from the same. And in the third year, you'll be right back. In just a couple of three years, you're going to be right back to sowing and reaping and planting vineyards and eating their fruit. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah will again take root downward and bear fruit upward. He's saying, boys, it's not over until I say it's over. Verse 32, for out of Jerusalem will go forth a remnant and out of Mount Zion survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Assyria was going down, but Judah was going up. They were going to remain. They were going to prosper. And God completed his prophetic word through Isaiah. Verse 33, therefore thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. He will not come to this city. He will not shoot an arrow there. And he will not come before it with a shield and throw up a siege ramp against it by the way that he came, by the same way he's going to return. And he will not come to this city, declares the Lord, for I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. When Hezekiah and Judah were attacked, they didn't start panicking. They didn't start crying. They didn't start asking people what to do. They gave their burden to the Lord. That's the requirement for deliverance. Do you know why people, do you know why God sent to his enslaved people in Egypt who'd been there for 400 years? You know why he sent Moses? Because God's people cried out to him in prayer. Exodus 3, or 2, 23. Now it came about it in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed. They'd been in Egypt for 400 years. They were slaves. And he had been killing their children and everything else. The sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, their bondage. And they cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. Prayer moves the hand of God. Say that with me. Prayer moves the hand of God. When you're attacked, give your burden to the Lord. I want you to read one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's one of my best friends right here. It's called, his name is Psalm 55, 22. One of the finest scriptures in the whole Bible. I want you to get to know this one. Let's read it together. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. I want you to close your eyes right now. Think of at least one burden that is on you right now and then we're gonna do something. Just think about it right now. Lord, what is that one burden? What is that one thing that keeps me awake at night? Lord, what is it that I need to cast upon you? Now, even in a Baptist church, you know what you cast things with? With your hands, all right? So I want you just to lift up your hands. Nobody's looking at you. Don't worry about it. Just lift up your hands and, and just cast it to the Lord. And say, God, I give it to you. Do it right now. Say, God, I give this to you. Say it with me. God, I give this to you. Take it in Jesus' name. Take it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank the Lord that we can cast all of our burdens upon the Lord. Amen. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your anxiety, all your care upon him because he cares for you. When you're attacked, give your burden to the Lord. That's God's requirement for deliverance. The reason for deliverance, if you live for the Lord, you're going to be attacked. The requirement for deliverance, when you're attacked, give your burden to the Lord in prayer. But then the restitution of deliverance, the restitution of deliverance, the result of deliverance is this. The Lord takes your burden and vindicates you. Now I want to tell you something somebody told me a long time ago when I was a young preacher. Steve, along the way people will come after you. Just give them to the Lord. He is a more exacting judge than you'll ever be. I don't have to vindicate myself. The Lord will do that. 
If I live for him, he'll do that. Do for that for you too. Verse 36, then the angel of the Lord went out. Uh Uh-oh. One angel is about to show them how tiny, tiny their king was. About to take Sennacherib down. He struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians, and when the men arose early in the morning, behold, all of these were dead. Where's Rabshakeh now? And they all knew God did it. They knew it was not an attack from man. They knew no army had come in there in the night and killed 185,000 people. You might kill 185 people, but you wouldn't kill 185,000 without somebody noticing something. God did this. God's angel did this. Some of y'all worried about some demon. I got news for you. I'm not going to try to test a demon or anything else, but I got news for you. One angel of God is more powerful than any demon out there anywhere. Amen? Anywhere. You walk with God, he will put his angels around you, and nothing can come into your life if you're walking with God that God doesn't allow. Now, God will allow some things to come that you may not like, but he will give his angels charge concerning thee to guard thee in all thy ways. Amen. 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians and when men rose early in the morning, behold, all these were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed. I guess so. He tucked his tail and ran, amen? And departed home and returned home and lived in Nineveh came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nishroch his god, Adramelech and Sherezer his sons killed him with the sword. What a terrible death. And they escaped into the land of Ararat, and Esarhaddon his son became king in his place. God did more in a few days than any man could have ever done in a whole lifetime. God answers our prayers and does exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think. And God vindicated his people. David prayed for God to vindicate him all the time against his enemies. 1 Samuel 24, 12, he's talking He's talking to wicked King Saul, who was demonized. He said, may the Lord judge between you and me, Saul, and may the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. I'm not going to hurt you, but I'm telling you, Saul, if you don't back off of me, God's going to take you down, and God did. God vindicated David. David said in Psalm 43, verse 1, Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Psalm 54, verse 1, Save me, O God, by your name, and vindicate me by your power. What you need to do, if somebody's come after you and you're, you're trying to live for the Lord, now look, if you've been you know, sinful and somebody comes after you, just own it, all right? But if you're trying to live for the Lord and somebody comes after you and you hadn't done anything to them, you know what? Just give them over to God and God will take care of them. He will. Maybe not in your time, maybe not in your way, but he will. The restitution of deliverance, the Lord takes your burden and vindicates you. Some of y'all are going through hard times right now. Satan's coming against you because you love the Lord Jesus. Give your burden to the Lord in prayer. Lay your burden before the Lord. He'll take that burden and he'll deliver you. He might deal with your enemies immediately like he did for Hezekiah or he might deal with them of a later, on a later time. That's his business. How he answers, your business is to ask. His business is to answer. And he'll always answer in the right way. He knows a lot more about it than you do. The whole situation. That's why Paul said in Romans 12, 19, never take your own revenge. Say that with me. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. 
for it is written. Say this out loud with me now. Read it from the screen. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord takes your burden and vindicates you. Do you need deliverance today? Do you? Are you married to someone who's hard to live with? Have you got a rebellious child? Are you being tempted to sin in some particular way? Are you having a hard time with people at work, people at school, people in the church? Is the devil bombarding your mind with sinful thoughts, fearful thoughts, discouraging thoughts, angry thoughts, immoral thoughts? Don't be surprised. Don't even be upset. Don't be afraid. Go to the Lord in prayer. If it's big enough to bother you, it's big enough to take to the Lord in prayer. And when you pray, trust God. He's going to work it out for his glory. Let's thank him for being such a good God. Amen. If the world from you withholds all its silver and its gold, and you have to get along with meager fare. Oh, just remember in his word, he said he feeds those little birds. Take your burden to the Lord. Leave it there, oh, leave it there, leave it there, take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust him through your doubt, oh, he'll surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. And if your body suffers pain and if your health you can't regain and your soul is slowly sinking into despair Jesus knows the way you feel and he can still save or oh, he can still heal take your burden to my Jesus and leave it there. Oh, leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there. Just take your burden to the Lord. Just take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you'll trust him in your doubt, if you'll trust him with your doubt, he'll surely bring you out. He will surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord. Lead him there. Oh, take your burden.
Thank you, Lord, for being our burden barrier. Thank you that you love us as much as you loved Hezekiah. And you'll defend us. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. And if that's your prayer, say amen.